Amen. Good morning, church. Should we try that again? <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad to be here, and I hope that you are too, and I hope that God is going to bless us through this time. My name is Patrick Six, so if you don't know me, uh, that's, that's my name, and I'm just a member here at, uh, at this wonderful fellowship. If you came here to hear Daryl, I apologize for that. You're not going to hear from Daryl. What you are going to hear is the Word of God. That's what Daryl preaches. That is my blessing and my privilege to deliver that to you as well. And so uh, my prayer is that we will all be blessed in what we study together today. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 13, so if you would take your Bibles and, um, I don't know, turn there, click there, whatever you have to do to get there, uh, just, just do that. Hebrews chapter 13. As you look at a broad look at, uh, at Hebrews Really, it's, it's all about the superiority of Christ. And so as you open it up, you begin to read. You'll see it's talking about the superiority of Christ over angels. He talks about the superiority of Christ over the, uh, the Abrahamic covenant. He talks about the superiority of Christ over the priesthood. So it's all about the superiority of Christ. And then interspersed in, uh, in different places through there, he will talk about you, and that's when it gets really personal. That's the application part, but you. Well, then he gets to chapter, basically chapter 12, and more specifically in chapter 13. And um, it's, it's, the way I would describe it is he's, he's trying to take care of a, a few miscellaneous items. And so he doesn't go into great detail on them, but he mentions them. Why is that? Because these topics, the topics are so important to the church. And one of those is the issue of marriage. And so in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, that's the, word, the one that we're going to focus on today, it simply says this, Marriage is to be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. You read that verse, and if you read only that verse, you think, Whoa. This is a heavy topic. Yes, it is. And so I hope that you will understand, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, the gravity, I guess, that I feel in bringing this message to you. And the reason that I do is because the Bible, as it was given to us and written to us thousands of years ago, stands up against a culture that counters what the Bible teaches about really so many subjects, marriage being one of those. The reason that I know that is that I am a retired pastor, so for all that, that time during my, my ministry, um, I would perform uh, wedding ceremonies. And so prior to that, I would have a time of uh, premarital coaching, some people call it premarital counseling, marriage preparation, whatever you want to call it. And I would meet with couples over, um, you know, a series of meetings. My wife and I would, would work together with them. And so as I'm entering into that time with them, I would take some information from them. And so I'd have them fill out this f little form, you know, your name, address, contact information, that kind of stuff. And... So in the early part of my ministry, most of the time, they would, as we're filling out this form, they would be at two different addresses. But then over time, I began to notice kind of a trend, is that more and more of these couples were at the same address, and early on, they were kind of embarrassed about that. Well, we're, you know, here's our address, and we're already living together. And then over time... I found, a real, found uh, the realization that they're giving me, we're at the same address, and they thought nothing of it. Uh, Hollywood and the movies and music would tell you, look, we don't, we don't drive society, we just kind of reflect it. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. I believe that movies and music have a huge influence and impact on the trends, and they actually push the trends, and this is one of those things that I have observed throughout my life of living. You guys, you can tell by looking at me, I wasn't born yesterday, right? I've been around a while, and so I've seen these, tre these trends being lived out. 
The reason I feel like this message is so important to us today is because it runs counter to what our culture is telling us. And there may be some of these people, just in reading this verse, if you paid close attention to what I just read a few moments ago, you may be thinking, well, I'm just not so sure that this kind of topic needs to be talked about in the church. So let me, let me just give you this food for thought, okay? If the world is not afraid to talk about it, in television shows, movies, songs, all different types of media, if the world isn't afraid to talk about it, then why should Christians be afraid to talk about it? If the world is going to give a view that is opposite or something way different from what the Bible gives to us, then why shouldn't the church be talking about it? So I submit this to you. We need to be talking about what God's Word has to say about marriage, about sex, and God's intention for those and the boundaries that He has set up for, for these. So before I say anything else, I want you to understand this. I grew up with the idea that sex is bad. It's not, okay? Let me qualify that. Married sex is good. That's what the Bible outlines for us. And so we're going to take a look at that today. Now, realize this, folks, at any time we're talking about marriage, um, you have to understand that marriage is a difficult thing. And so as I'm bringing this, y'all, I'm not talking to only to married people. I realize that in a room of this size, we have, you know, we run the full gamut of, of people. We have those who are single, never married. We have those who are married and divorced. We have those who are divorced, not married. We have those who are living together outside of marriage. We have, you know, we have we, those who are widowed. So we run the full gamut probably within, within this room. So some of you may be thinking, well, because I'm not married, this message isn't for me. No, it is. And so listen carefully because I'm going to get to that in just a few moments. <clears throat> marriage relationship is one of the most difficult things that people can enter into. And so it takes a lot of work, and sometimes people have to go to get some help for their marriage. I'm thinking about one couple that I heard of. <clears throat> they had been married for a while, but you know, like so many couples, the, the relationship just kind of gets, tends to get a little bit old and a little bit stale, and they thought, well, we've got to do something. Uh, and so they, they go to this marriage counselor, and so the marriage counselor meets with them f- a few times, and finally, he gets to the idea, he's thinking, okay, I know how to really hone in on this. And so um, I'm just going to give this guy here an illustration. <clears throat> so the marriage counselor stands up and he calls the wife over to him. And he plants a kiss on that lady that is long and passionate, to which the husband is just... And finally, the counselor looks at that man and he says, Sir, that's what she needs at least three times a week. Well, the husband shocked and appalled. The wife shocked, maybe not so appalled, but she's shocked. (laughs) But the husband just didn't know what to do. Finally, he says, three times a week. I play golf on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I could bring her by on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's not what we're talking about, y'all. That is a joke, not a true story, okay? (laughs) So let's take a look at this, and let's just see what God's Word has to say for a few moments, and understand this, that what I'm going to share with you today is in no way comprehensive teaching on marriage or on the sexual relationship within marriage. But the first thing that I want you to see is God's call to respect marriage. Look at what it says in the first half of the verse. He says, marriage is to be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled. So it is to be respected by all people. That word respect or that word honored um, is a great word, timios, which means held in honor. It means esteemed. It means especially dear. That's the, the biblical definition of it. 
Now, our pastor is the king of visual illustrations. I'm not. I thought about bringing one, and I thought, no, because if I do, people will be thinking, he's trying to be Daryl. I'm not trying to be Daryl. So if you could just, but I am going to try to attempt a visual illustration with you. You're just going to have to use your imagination, okay? Let's suppose that I have a platform up here, and on this side over here is a paper cup. And in the middle is going to be a, a glass or a cup. That's just, it's one that you would use every day. And over here is this china cup. Okay? And the idea is this. If you let this be a picture of your marriage, it's not the same as these others. There are certain relationships that you have that you will have them for a while. And those relationships may be due to a move, maybe due to some type of a... Uh, a shift in occupation or something like that, this relationship is probably going to go away. Basically, it's disposable. It's not a permanent relationship. So you're going you're to throw that one away. You're going to lose it at some point. But in the middle, there's these other relationships that are kind of your everyday relationships. They are your working relationships. Maybe they are your family relationships. They're your friendships. They are something that is you use Every single day. You don't throw it away. It's not disposable. It's special to you. But if something happens and it breaks, life is going to go on. You're going to move on. But the one over here, this China, and (laughs) I think we're we're living in a in a culture, mine included, that you know, China is not what it, it used to be. Okay. It used to be parents, man, they wanted to give their China to their children and they would have it in this special cabinet. Okay, and you don't use that every day. It is highly honored. It is in a special place. And if one of those pieces gets broken, somebody's in trouble. Right? Okay, so your marriage relationship, let that be reflected by this this piece, this cup that is china. It's special. It's not like everything else. In fact, it has its own place, a place of distinction. That's the way God intends the marriage to be. And he says here that he intends for it to be held in honor, not just by the husband and the wife. He says it is to be honored by all. That word all is all encompassing. So whether you have been married before or not, you should honor marriage. Whether you are married now, you should honor marriage. Whether you have been married and divorced Maybe married, divorced, and remarried, you need to honor marriage. If you're widowed, you need to honor marriage. That's what this word is giving to us. We are all to honor this idea of marriage. There are some that it seems like nowadays they kind of have the idea of, well, what's the big deal about having your name on a piece of paper called a marriage certificate? Or what's the big deal about making such a big deal about the wedding ceremony. Well, God makes a big deal about it. He makes a very big deal about it. In fact, what we call some type of legal institution, God actually calls it something very, very different. In Malachi, the Old Testament book of Malachi, there is a verse here. It says this. This is, and basically, this is what the prophet Malachi is speaking, really coming down hard on the priests. But listen, the message is clear to us today. Here's what Malachi wrote as he wrote this. He said, and this is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offering or receives them gladly from your hands. Yet you ask, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have acted treacherously against her, though, listen to this carefully, though she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Now, I don't have time to go into a a lot of teaching on covenant, but let me just, let me just make this statement that covenant in the Old Testament was a very heavy Word. You do not enter into a covenant relationship haphazardly. And any time that there is a covenant that is established, the, literally the word is cut in the Old Testament, but any time there is a covenant established between 
two parties. It was a formal agreement. Was there any kind of formality of this in the beginning? Well, think back to me, with me, to Genesis chapter 2. God creates the man. Man has given names to all the animals. God says, you don't have a helpmate. I'm going to bring one to you. So God causes a deep sleep to fall on the man, takes one of his ribs, fashions a woman. And here's the picture of this. Watch this. When the man wakes up, the Bible says that God presents the woman to the man. Now, when Duana and I got married 41 years ago, standing at the altar of First Baptist Church in Canyon, Texas, we had no idea that what was being established there was a covenant. But within that wedding ceremony, there is a very beautiful picture, and that is the dad walking the daughter down the aisle. You see a picture of this in Genesis chapter 2 when God presents the woman to the man. The beginning of that covenant relationship. And it says in that text there in Genesis 2 that man would leave his father and his mother, cleave to his wife, and the two would become one flesh. Jesus said something about the formality of the marriage relationship in Matthew chapter 19. He's being questioned by the Pharisees about divorce. And this is Jesus' response. Haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? And Jesus also said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, and these are the words of Jesus, what God has joined together, let no man separate. What is Jesus getting at there? Marriage is a covenant relationship intended to be shared by two people, the husband and the wife. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews, as he's speaking, he goes on to say, not only is it to be honored by all, but the marriage bed is to be kept undefiled. That word marriage bed, the, the Greek word is koite. And it is literally a reference to, this, to sexual intercourse, to the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. That's why it uses the term the marriage bed. So here's just a few thoughts. And this is a point of application for us, okay? In terms of in terms of honoring the marriage, how can that be done between a husband and a wife? Well, in the first place, the marriage needs to be between the two of you only. That means it's locked up in this cabinet, not to be messed with by anyone else. It's to be protected. It's to be cherished. It's to be honored. It's not to be mixed in with all of the other relationships. You hear what I'm saying? Your marriage is sacred and you need to treat it that way so what are some things that you can do look we all know that there's conflict involved in life there's also conflict involved in marriages so learn how to work through conflict productively what do i mean by that very quickly one of the things that i've seen i've observed this in, in our lives is that when we're not getting along one friend called it when we're having intense fellowship <laughs> when we're not getting along we don't see things eye to eye then we're both and then correct me if i'm wrong but y'all this is our tendency while she's talking i may or may not be listening very well i may very well be forming my defense or my rebuttal and by the time we go back and forth with well i feel this will i feel that Man, look, conflict is exhausting, is it not? It's pretty tiring. And so by the time you, you air your griefs to one another, this is where many couples stop because it's emotionally wearing. And so they'll stop right there. Oh, I got to say what I wanted to say. I got to say what I wanted to say. You know what we finally learned in our relationship? Is to ask another very, very important question. What needs to change? What needs to change? Because you see, when the two of us come to that question and we start working together toward a re resolution, now 
we're no longer pulling at one another, we're pulling with one another. And we're looking for a right answer and a positive direction for the conflict and for the relationship. That's just one example. So learn how to work through conflict. Learn how to work on your finances together. There are some, Dr. Dobson many, many years ago said that there are some marriage killers. One of those is finances. And in my working with couples through the, the years are working with couples, most of the time when they're in conflict and they're coming to us, they may say, well, the issue is this, the issue is that. But most of the time, as we continue to talk, money is going to come into the picture somehow. They're not seeing eye to eye, and they're not working together on the finances. The finances is one of those. Physical uh, intimacy is another, what he calls a, a marriage killer when it's not working right. Your, your, your family or your in-laws, that can be a marriage killer in the relationship. And then physical infidelity, sexual infidelity, that's a marriage killer. Four basic areas. So if you'll just take those to heart and say, okay, I'm going to be a student. I'm going to learn how to work through these things in a productive way. We are going to work through these things. Marriage conferences are great. They're great tools. Marriage counseling, Christian marriage counseling is a great tool. The Bible is a great tool for you to learn about God's blueprint, God's plan for marriage. So read this. I would say start here. So there are a lot of different things that you and I can do to honor the marriage relationship. But then we need to sanctify. He calls us to sanctify marriage, and that's where we're talking about this, this marriage bed. Greek word meaning koite. Literally means this. It, when we're talking about, the, it says keep the marriage bed undefiled. That word literally means this. I'm just going to read it to you. Unsoiled, pure, Free from that which the nature of a thing is deformed and debased, or its force and vigor impaired. So listen, the, the marriage bed can be defiled in a lot of different ways. It can, be, it can be defiled by the kind of music you listen to, the movies that you watch, what you read. The pictures that you look at, I mean, it could be any, so many different things. And we're living in a culture where, where sexual images are just so in your face. So the world is not for you. The world is working against you. God is for you. He is for you. Let me read this, share, this verse of Scripture with you. And it's very, very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral person, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, Greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. I want to stop right there, okay? And back up to what the writer of Hebrews is saying in the last part of this verse where he says, because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Those two terms are given in both of these verses, Hebrews chapter 13 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that I just shared with you. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6 gives a more comprehensive list than that. So let me just step away from the topic at hand for just a moment and to say that those who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven is broader than just the two terms given to us in Hebrews chapter 13. Let me read the list again. No sexually immoral person, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. If you just stop right there, I probably just landed on almost everyone in this room. You think, well, I'm not a sexually immoral person, but yeah, greed is, yeah, I, I struggle with greed. Or, well, yeah, I wouldn't say, I'm, I'm not an adulterer, that's for sure, but 
Verbally abusive? Yeah, I, yeah, I struggle with that one. So there's a list here. And he makes a statement, these won't inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's bad news. Unless you go on. Let me read the next few verses here. Next couple of verses. Paul continues to write, And some of you used to be like this. Some of you used to be like this. In other words, the people that he's writing to, he said at one time, that was your world. That was your practice. That's who you were. That's what you did. But, but, here he continues to write, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if I just identified you in that list, not I, but the Lord, really, it's His Word, not me, I'm just reading it. But if God identified you and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now saying, yeah, you're, you're, that's where you are, then I'm just letting you know there's a way out. There is the way out. His name is Jesus Christ. And if you think that God can't deliver you, just look at those people as an example. But through our years of marriage, the Lord has allowed us to make, have some wonderful friendships, some great relationships. And really through our own experiences in, in many years of ministry, I could tell you story after story after story, but there's one I want to share with you. Some friends of ours that are now involved in ministry, their early marriage was horrible, from really from the very beginning. But they had three daughters. And as the third one was a little baby, their marriage, it had pretty much ended before then, but they, they divorced after that. He hadn't gotten, gotten involved in an affair. I'm not going to tell you too much about it because I hope and I pray that the Lord will bring them here at some point and they can share with you more fully. But... Um, Okay, so without giving all the details, let me just uh, tell you that there came a point in his life where he realized, he said, I have ruined my life, I have ruined my family, I have ruined my marriage, I have broken it all. And in desperation, he called out to Jesus Christ. He embraced Jesus as his Lord and his Savior, and he said, when I did that, God spoke these words to me. I am going to fix what you broke. And so he went back to his wife. God had already been convicting her that she wanted the marriage to be restored. And so together, with the Lord's help, they made that decision. And they went and told their girls that they were going to get, get remarried. And that this time, God was going to be in charge of that that family. Now, Lori is a very shy, she would, she would describe herself to you as an introvert. But I remember the first time we had them as, as guests at our uh, church that, that I pastored, and she, we asked, asked her if she would share, and she said, no, thank you very much. But she did. And that started something. They now travel to other nations, talking to pastors and their wives in other nations, telling their story to the glory of God. Let me tell you another story. When I was a pastor in Spearman, Texas, there was this couple that were just, by the time that we got to know them, she was already well in advance in uh, dementia, al Alzheimer's, she couldn't do anything for herself. But I met her husband. He told me, he said, Pastor, he said, during the invitation, I just, I'm just telling you ahead of time, I'm not upset. I'm leaving because I need to go to the nursing home to feed my wife. I said, okay. He explained it to me. And that's what he did. But there were times during the, uh, the week, 
And sometimes I would go to the nursing home and I would see Bob uh, out in the hallway feeding his wife. But one time in particular, I was on my way out of town and I stopped at an intersection where the, the nursing home was. And I just, you know, how you glance, look ways. Well, I saw down the street and I saw Bob with his wife. They were under a tree, parked under the tree. She was in a wheelchair and he was kneeling down beside her. I can't kneel all the way down. Kneeling down beside her. I, I don't know what they were saying. I just saw the expression on his face. And it was nothing but love. She eventually died and I was talking to the family, getting ready for the funeral message. And they talked to me about what a strong witness their mom had been all of her days of nursing and how she had been able to witness to some of the patients along the way. But one of the, one of the kids said, you know, here's, here's the assurance that we have. If for some reason it had been the other way around, if it had been dad in the wheelchair, if it had been dad unable to feed himself, our mom would have done the same thing. I just ask you a question. Which picture? Which picture would you prefer? I don't know where life is going to take us. I don't know. But we'll do this with God's help. And I believe you can too. I want to leave you with this. Listen to me. God is a God of love, a God of grace, a God of redemption. And He will meet you where you are. But that doesn't mean that He's willing to leave you there. Anytime God's Holy Spirit comes into a life, He comes right in the middle of our mess. But then He begins a process of taking us where He wants us to go. Are you willing? If you found yourself somewhere in that list that I read to you just a few moments ago, this could be your story. But, you were washed. You were cleansed. You were sanctified. You were justified. I love this definition of justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. So maybe this morning, God's call to you is, is to be saved. Uh, that's the first step in this whole thing. That's the most important thing. You, if you're in this room right now and you're not saved or you don't know for sure if you're saved, the most important thing for you to do is to leave this room knowing that you know that you know. And you can do that. But there may be some of you that need to make a recommitment, not only of yourself to the Lord, but your marriage. Look, I don't know. I don't live in your house. I don't know what's going on when nobody else is around. But you do. The Father does. Maybe some of you are in a relationship right now. You're married. And God is convicting you. I mean, you're, you're not married. You're living together outside of marriage. And God is convicting you about that. Could I encourage you to go read John chapter 4, the woman at the well? Jesus convicted this woman. He had been talking to her. She said, I perceive that you're a prophet. And he said, go get your husband and come back and we'll talk. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, that's true. You've had five. And the man that you're living with right now is not your husband. It's, it's another way we know that Jesus makes a distinction between those who are married and those who aren't. Jesus touched her that day. He changed her. And you know that by reading the rest of the story. So go back and read John chapter 4. I'm just telling you, listen to me, God is offering hope to people, to marriages today. What do you need to do with that? Maybe some of you are burdened about somebody in your life, a couple in your life that they're going through difficulties. They don't, they're acting like the marriage isn't going to make it. Maybe you just need to come and pray for them. So I'm going to lead us in a quick prayer. My wife and I are going to be over here to the side. Uh, we're just going to let God take this and do with it 
what he wants to. If you want to come and pray, this altar is wide open. You feel free to do that. Let's just let the Spirit do what the Spirit wants to do here today, okay? Pray with me, please. Dear Lord Jesus, I am so grateful for your word, and I thank you that you cover this topic as painful as it may be for some because of what they have been through. You can say, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. You were set free. You don't have to live with that past anymore. But Father, there may be some who need to bring their sins and just lay them at your feet right now. So for those, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to them and give them the courage to do what they need to do. I pray for a restoration of homes and marriages throughout this country, Lord. This is one of our strongest witnesses, is the way we live out our marriage relationship. The Holy Spirit, be at work and do what you can do best. You are the life changer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.